thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks for coming out on a Wednesday for the special edition of this series. Uh, I did change the title of my talk slightly. Uh, the old version it was a little a bit of a mouthful. So, um, in any case, before I start, um, just briefly, I'm, I'm happy to take questions as they come up, um, especially if clarification questions. Please ask them as I go. Um, any issues that you think might lead to a longer discussion or debate, I'd ask you to maybe hold on to those until the very end, uh, just because I don't want to keep you guys longer than you're able to stay or willing to stay. Um, and and I, I think this talk, yeah, it may take me around an hour to get through with, with include, including for time for clarification. But then time for discussion to end. And uh, secondly, um, I will be around for coffee and, and the informal discussion that usually takes place when, when to three, um, and then maybe a little bit more in the afternoon after after that. Um, then again, um, tomorrow morning. <coughs> okay. Um, so there are a lot of things in this world that we know are either good for us or bad for us. Um, so leafy green vegetables are good for us, and refined sugars are bad for us, and exercise is good for us, and Smoking is bad for us. Um, social relationships fall into this unique category of, uh, of phenomena in our, in our lives that can either be very, very good for us or, or bad for us. So on the one hand, we know that social relationships are absolutely essential for the, uh, the healthy development of a human infant, and that these relationships predict uh, health outcomes, both physical and mental health outcomes throughout the lifespan. And as a species, the formation of social relationships allows us to achieve cooperative goals and, and undertake certain projects that would be uh, very difficult or impossible to do on our own. On the other hand, the social relationships are one of the primary sources of stress and anxiety and conflict in our lives. And in extreme cases can lead to uh, acts of physical violence. And on the flip side of this nice cooperative picture I showed you, you see human beings who, who form cooperative relationships in order to wage war and, and to kill each other. So in, in addition to being a phenomenon in which uh, the outcomes are extremely divergent uh, for our species, the, the effects of uh, social relationships on our lives can be a matter of life and death. And uh, so just to put some numbers on, on that particular claim, this is a recent meta-analysis that was done on the effects of various um, uh, factors in our lives on mortality risk. And as you see, social relationships come out on top above even smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity, and BMI. So uh, very, very important for, for um, our, our health here. And on the flip side, uh, disorders such as uh, psychopathology, such as social phobia, are actually one of the, the we represent some of the most common um, mental disorders and, and societal burdens um, in the United States right up there with major depressive disorder in terms of prevalence. I think Tom Inzel, the, the head of the NIMH in the United States, said it quite well when he claimed uh, that we are, by nature, a highly affiliative species craving social contact. And when social experience becomes a source of anxiety rather than a source of comfort, we have lost something fundamental, whatever we call it. So I hope I've convinced you through this very brief uh, overview um, into, into social relationships that it's, it's a very important issue for, um, for um, um, various lines of research. My particular research in the last few years has focused on a few specific questions, the first of which is what personal and situational factors motivate individuals to seek out social contacts and to try to form relationships in the first place? Uh, then what personal and situational factors influence uh, our reactions to things like social conflict and social stress and threat, and uh, then also what personal and situational factors influence the tendency to seek and accept social support when stress or threat. And um, hopefully without spoiling the punchlines of my talk too much, just because I'm going to be covering um, studies using really a broad range of methodologies and looking at biological and psychological factors on both individual difference levels and also normative uh, normative functioning levels and as well as, um, as uh, situational factors that influence these kinds of things. I'd just like to give you a couple organizing themes or recurrent themes that are going to kind of tie everything together and, and be recurring threads that run through all these studies. The first of which is that the oxytocin system seems to influence 
sensitivity to social support and social threat. And the second is that social threat in particular and our ability to regulate uh, our reactions to it fundamentally shape social cognition and social behavior. Okay, so this is an overview of the five studies I'll be presenting today, but I'll come back to the slide and sort of orient you to where I am throughout the talk. And because I'll be talking quite a bit about oxytocin, I'd like to just present some background information just so we're, we're all on the same page about why it's why it's interesting in this context. So oxytocin is a neurotransmitter and a, and a hormone that is uh, secreted uh, from the hypothalamus, produced in the hypothalamus and secreted from the posterior pituitary gland. So here, produced here, secreted here to various targets in the body as well as in the brain. So it's peripheral effects, it's effects on the body have been known for quite some time. It's involved, for example, in labor contractions during childbirth. Uh, it's also involved in the milk letdown reflex during, child, uh, during breastfeeding. Uh, its central effects on the brain have, uh, within the brain, have been the target of a lot of interest for neuroscientists and psychologists within maybe the last couple decades or so. And uh, this, this research really owes a lot to uh, animal models and, and researchers looking at the role of oxytocin in mammalian so, uh, social behavior. So using a wide range of methodologies, looking at a number of different species, um, it's pretty clear at this point that oxytocin plays a very central role in mammalian social behaviors, including pair bonding, maternal behavior, social memory, and stress reactivity. And uh, on the level of neuroanatomy, we know that uh, species that are very, very similar physically and also genetically, so the most famous example is the prairie voles. You might have heard something about those guys. Prairie voles and the montane voles. So even, even researchers who have worked with these guys for a really long time, they, they hold one in each hand. They say they're very, very difficult to tell apart. Um, however, uh, by their behavior, they're, they're very easy to tell apart. The, the, the prairie voles uh, form monogamous pair bonds, and the montane voles are socially uh, polygamous. And also, the distribution of receptors for oxytocin in the brain varies dramatically, um, most, most critically in, in some of the areas uh, of the uh, reward pathways in the brain, that the, um, the, the prairie voles and the monogamous ones show more um, expression of oxytocin receptors in those areas. And we know that this is not just a uh, correlational, that we, we know so through some additional methods, genetic manipulation methods, that that's actually a causal relationship. So if you, if you cause the um, Montane voles to express more oxytocin receptors in these certain areas of the brain, they begin to show social behaviors that look more like the prairie <coughs> So in, in humans, our methods for studying the role of oxytocin on human social behavior are a little bit more limited. I mean, we can't genetically manipulate humans to produce more oxytocin or, or, or less oxytocin in an ethical way, um, in the same way that, that is, can be done with animals. However, there are a couple methods that are available for um, studying these questions in humans. The first of which is intranasal administration of oxytocin. So this method allows uh, the oxytocin to cross into the brain and it allows experimenters nice control uh, to, to run placebo-controlled studies where you can randomly sign participants to receive either oxytocin or placebo, uh, same dose, standardized dosage, standardized timing, and look for differential effects on behavior depending on whether they receive the oxytocin. And the, the studies that have um, um, used this methodology have, have shown a number of interesting and very parallel effects of oxytocin on human social behavior, as what's been seen in other species. For example, that it plays a role in human attachment, maternal behavior, social memory, stress reactivity, trust, eye contact, emotion reading, among other things. And uh, there are a handful of, a, of uh, neuroimaging studies at this point suggesting that, that that one potential pathway through which the, these effects uh, on the behavioral level occur is that oxytocin seems to modulate uh, amygdala activation to social stimuli, in particular downregulating reactivity towards negative social stimuli and upregulating reactivity towards positive social stimuli. So these results have been interesting to various people for various kinds of reasons. Um, the, the media has picked up on this and had a field day with this. It feels like every other day, if you if you pick up a newspaper or do a Google search, you'll see a headline like this: uh, Scientists study trust in a bottle. Oxytocin has blockbuster potential as a lifestyle drug. Could the cuddle chemical oxytocin improve male sexual function? It's also been called a hug drug, and believe it or not, there's actually a company out there that sells something called Liquid Trust, 
And it's basically uh, oxytocin in a spray form that you're supposed to wear like a cologne or a perfume. As you can see, they 100% satisfaction guarantee that it's going to change your life, it's going to improve your sex life, and it's going to improve your, your relationship with your boss and your employees because basically it's going to make everybody trust you, right? So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of filtering from, from the level of the scientific research to how the media portrays uh, the effects of oxytocin that are not necessarily the most, I would say, rigorous or scientific. Um, however, there is also a very, very important and, and scientifically rigorous um, application of oxytocin that, that has received a lot of attention and, and excitement in the last few years, and that's the potential to use oxytocin as part of the therapy for certain psychopathology. In particular, those kinds of psychopathologies that are characterized by the kind of social deficits that oxytocin seems to be acting on. Right? So if you just go to this website that's called uh, clinicaltrials.gov, this is a uh, large database of all the active clinical trials going on, or many of the active clinical trials going on um, worldwide. I did a search recently just putting in oxytocin and intranasal administration and found easily 70 studies. Uh, using oxytocin as part of a therapeutic approach um, on populations of individuals, including those with social anxiety disorder, PTSD, autism, schizophrenia, depression, borderline personality disorder, and, and several others. So, so again, a lot of excitement in this area. Um, on the other hand, you might have read, also in the media, or seen some, some of the studies, uh, headlines like this, oxytocin may have a dark side, or that the aerocaptide oxytocin regulates uh, protocol altruism and intergroup conflict among humans, that it promotes human ethnocentrism, or that it can hinder trust and cooperation in some individuals. Um, I, I, I don't, it's outside of the scope of my talk to go into this too much. I mean, our group has responded to some of this. We wrote a commentary recently uh, with, with our sort of alternative interpretations of some of what's going on here. I think there's a lot of open questions about the effects of oxytocin, whether there's uh, differential effects of oxytocin on in-group versus out-group members and what that means for intergroup conflict. There's definitely a lot of interest in this area, which I think is great for the field, um, a lot of open questions. Um, if you're particularly interested in intergroup conflict and oxytocin effects in that context, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that later. Um, just suffice it to say, uh, regardless of what you think of the results or the interpretations uh, of the individual studies I'm, I'm showing you here, um, the, the point is generally well taken and certainly absolutely valid that, uh, that it's a massive oversimplification of the effects of oxytocin and call it simply a hug drug or a cuddle chemical or even to, even to, to claim that its effects are to make us more pro-social. I mean, it, the, the story is bound to be much more complicated than that and I think also much more, more interesting than that. Um, but in any case, um, as far as the challenges for oxytocin-based therapy, those clinical trials that I mentioned just a minute ago are showing really mixed results in, in the kind of initial phases of the results. And, and some are showing very promising uh, effects of oxytocin for some of these patient populations. Others are showing absolutely no effects. And I think one of the um, important messages is that um, one, one thing that we need to continue supporting, in addition to these very, very important uh, and influential um, clinical trials that are going on, um, more basic research that will really help to identify individual differences in reactions to the oxytocin administration. And we already have evidence to suggest that there are interactions with personality, interactions with social context from some of these researchers that I showed you in the last slide. What I'm going to be covering mainly today is interactions with um, genes. So the particular genetic variation I'll be talking about is uh, variation in the oxytocin receptor gene. So um, to remind you, if you can imagine that the oxytocin is these, are these red balls that are being released and then being transmitted and then uh, binding to these receptors here, then you can easily see why any variation in the number of oxytocin receptors or the distribution of oxytocin receptors in the brain or the efficiency with which the oxytocin receptors are working is going to really directly affect the strength of the signal of oxytocin in the brain. So, so that's the motivation of, of looking uh, at this uh, genetic variance. And uh, just to give you a, a clear sense of the genetic variance I'm talking about, so the oxytocin receptor gene in humans is located on chromosome 3, and we've been looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms of this gene, which is called SNPs for short. And what that means is it's a simply a, a 
one particular location within the DNA sequence where some individuals might have a G allele, others have an A, and since we all inherit two copies, one from our mom and one from our dad, that means that some individuals are homozygous A, some are homozygous G, and some are heterozygous AG. Right? So there's a lot of natural variation in, 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 these, um, in, in the structure of the, the gene. Uh, this is just, again, um, for anybody who's particularly interested in the genetics, otherwise it's not so important in the slide, just to, to really show a different representation of the, the chromosome here, chromosome 3, on this level, and this is the gene. Um, and the particular SNP, or single nucleotide polymorphism that I'm talking about, that I'm going to be talking about is this one. Each SNP has an RS number, the one I'll be referring to is RS53576, and it is located on the intronic region of the gene. So. Uh, that means that it's a non-coding, and as, as far as we know, um, is probably a marker of a functional variant of the gene that has not been identified yet. Even though it isn't intronic, and we don't really know what, what functional consequences of it, this particular SNP, RS53576, uh, the A allele has been linked to a number of interesting social and emotional kind of outcomes. Uh, first of all, uh, reduced maternal sensitivity, reduced empathy, reduced trust, Increased stress reactivity, increased risk for autism in a number of studies, and also on the uh, neural level, structural and functional alterations of the system. So it seems to be interesting and relevant in, in some, um, some sense for social functioning in humans. And in the first study that I'll be talking about, um, my colleagues and I were interested in looking at the role of natural variation in the oxytocin system, particularly of this uh, SNP and sensitivity to social support. So social support, I mean, I probably don't need to tell any of you who are affiliated with the, the psychology department here, um, where, where uh, several, several people are studying this. Um, social support is one of the most uh, robust buffers against uh, stress responses. And given, first of all, the known role of oxytocin in regulating stress responses, and also its importance in um, its sensitivity to social context, we thought it might be interesting to look at uh, natural variation in the functioning of the oxytocin system and see if it predicts different people's uh, sensitivity to social support. So this is exactly what we asked in the first study. And uh, just to put this on a more kind of everyday context level, I mean, we probably, you all probably know some people who when they're stressed out, they seek out social contact and they seem to benefit from it a lot, right? And you probably also know other people who when they're, when they're stressed, they, um, they might prefer to actually be alone or um, if, if they're given social support, they might not receive it so well. Um, so this is the kind of natural variation that we were interested in, in looking at whether the oxytocin system um, is playing a role. Okay, so in this study we tested 203 healthy men, and we assigned them to one of two conditions, ran, uh, random assignment, uh, either social support or the no social support condition. So those in the social support condition were asked to come to our lab with a close female friend or a female partner. And those who are assigned to the no social support condition were simply told, come to our lab by yourself. And then we uh, collected DNA from them, from a saliva sample for genotyping, and then we exposed them to an acute laboratory social stressor. We used the Trier social stress test for groups. So this uh, stress test involves, basically, if you imagine yourself as a participant, you're standing somewhere here, and you see these judges who are in white lab coats, and who are kind of just have a neutral expression. They don't really smile at you. And you're having to present yourself as a job candidate. Um, so it's like a mock job interview. Right? It's already stressful, and then you're additionally told, hey, there's also a video camera in the corner, and you're going to be evaluated later. They're going to look at your nonverbal behavior and see how good it was. And then halfway through, it's a 20-minute uh, procedure. 10 minutes halfway through, after the job interview, you're told, surprise, you also have to do some mental arithmetic. Basically, they give you a huge number and say, subtract 17 from that number in your head as fast as possible. <laughs> Anytime you make a mistake, or if you're not going fast enough, we're going to correct you and you're going to have to start again. So, so as you can imagine, <laughs> it's a pretty robust str stressor. Um, you see uh, reliable increases in both the cortisol response, so physi uh, physiological stress, as well as self-reported subjective stress in response to this task. This is our timeline, and the, the main thing to, to point out here is that our experimental manipulation took place before the stressor. So participants came in, got instructions about what they're going to be having to do, then those in the social support condition went off to separate rooms and they were getting the social support from their, their female partners or their female friends um, in a separate room uh, for 10 minutes before the stressor, whereas the other individuals had the same 10 minutes, but they were preparing on their own. 
then they have the stressor and the recovery and debriefing period. Uh, and so what are they doing to prepare during those 10 minutes? What, what are they yeah, whatever they want. So they're told they have a job interview coming up, a mock job interview coming up. And we're get, we give them some paper and they, we say, um, you know, the judges are going to ask them some questions. Um, so just um, to prepare to present yourself as the best candidate possible for this position. And then uh, the social supporters, we don't give specific instructions. We just tell them, your job is to be supportive of, of your partner, your, your friend in this context. And then we just let them, yeah, um, do whatever they think is the most supportive. So we collect various measures of physiological stress as well as psychological stress throughout this session. We collect the salivary cortisol. Um, cortisol is a relatively slow reacting uh, response, so um, you'll see in my graphs later that, that most of the Um, that most of the interesting things are happening kind of like later on um, after the stress is actually over just because the cortisol response is, is slow. Um, then we had a measure of subjective stress at baseline after they received the social support or no social support but before the stressor, after the stressor, and also um, at recovery and during the recovery period. And then in a, in a new um, analysis that we went back and did on a subset of our uh, genetically stratified subsample of our, our um, pool, we looked at heart rate variability. And, and that's an interesting measure because it's a measure of parasympathetic acti activity. Um, and it's also very quick reacting. So we thought the most interesting place to look for effects of social support and genotype on uh, heart rate variability would be in this period of actually when they're receiving the social support and having to prepare alone. So we target that uh, point for this particular measure. Okay, so this, again, as I mentioned, this is a cortisol response. Um, this, is, this is time that you're seeing on this axis. This shaded area in the next several graphs I'm showing you is, is always uh, the, the period in which they're in the stress room, being stressed. And as you see, the, the cortisol peak takes place a little bit later. But this is a very standard um, uh, response. You see about a twofold, a little bit more than twofold cortisol response to the stressor. And this is, I'm showing you first the G carrier. So that's the GGs or the AGs. By genotype who have received no social support. So this is a kind of prototypical stress response cortisol level. <coughs> you see significant buffering for these individuals uh, who have received social support. So the social support <coughs> is working to buffer the uh, stress response on the physiological level. Uh, contrast that with the individuals with the AA genotype of this particular SNP. Uh, they show no significant difference uh, as a function of whether they receive social support or not. There, there is, I mean, these guys do seem a little higher at baseline, but the, the thing to point out, I think, and the thing that the, the measure that's most interesting to look at is the difference between peak minus baseline. That's the, the slope, basically. That's a measure of how reactive they were to the stressor itself, and there's, there's no difference here in the slopes. And uh, when you put these together, you see a significant interaction between the genotype and the social support condition in terms of predicting the cortisol response. The picture with physio, uh, sorry, psychological stress is similar. It's maybe a little bit more complicated, but uh, I'll take you through it again, showing you in the same order. The G carriers who had received no social support show this increase across time when they recover. Those G carriers who had received social support show a buffering, significant buffering um, before they went into the stress. So this is uh, the same at baseline, then right after they received the social support, uh, they show this buffering response, and the buffering doesn't seem to last, unfortunately, throughout the stress and, 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 uh, during recovery, but, but at least um, right after they got the social support, it seemed to work in the sense that they, they felt better about um, the situation they were going to go into. Contrast that with the AAs um, here in the same time period, no significant difference, no significant buffering um, there. They, they are lower here during recovery, but um, Kind of unclear to me what that means because this baseline is the baseline that they uh, filled out before they even knew what task they were going to do. So that <coughs> basically means they're recovering, they're saying that they're recovering to a level below baseline. So unclear what that means. In, in any case, uh, no difference here in, in, the, in what you see there compared to relative to what you saw with the two carriers. So again, significant uh, interaction between genotype and social support condition. And finally, heart rate variability. Again, this is just the time window, really uh, a really fine-grained time window when they're actually in the middle of receiving the social support or comparing alone, right? And here, the thing to remember is 
heart rate variability, the higher it is, the kind of better it is. It's a measure of higher parasympathetic activity, uh, better cardiac tone, and again, what pops out, the one group that pops out as benefiting from the social support or, or having the higher heart rate variability during this preparation phase is the GKRNs who receive social support. Everybody else is kind of around the same level. So in this first study, we showed that variation of the oxytocin receptor gene seems to predict adults' sensitivity to social support under stress. And we see this in a cortisol response as well as subjective stress and heart rate variability. Uh, interestingly, uh, again, I don't really have time to go into this, but, but we do see kind of parallel effects in a separate study with infants. So we tested infants' attachment status and uh, saw whether we could predict uh, statistically whether infants were more likely to be <coughs> Uh, were more likely to be rated as securely or insecurely attached um, as a function of their oxytocin receptor genotype. And uh, interestingly, if you think about attachment, I don't know how, how familiar you, um, there's probably some variation in how familiar you are with attachment theory, but basically um, part of the, 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 the theory about the, the primary function of the attachment bond between the mother and infant is, is to help the infant regulate his, stre uh, his or her stress. Um, so. The, the function of the caregiver is to be there when the infant is stressed, and different infants are able to use their caregiver really efficiently as a source of social support and to help regulate their stress. Others are less able. And this does also seem, again, um, uh, to pattern in some parallel way with what we saw with the adults. So evidence that not only are these uh, results, um, are, of this effect and this relationship uh, uh, visible in fully functional adult humans, but also re visible really early in life. Okay, in, in a second study, we were interested in kind of looking at the, the opposite relationship. Um, so instead of looking at uh, social input and its effects on um, the, the stress response, we were interested in the stress response as sort of the, uh, the physiological state and interested in that, the effects of that physiological state on social cognition kind of, again, flipping, flipping the independent and dependent variables a little bit. And we were interested in looking at whether acute stress influences sensitivity to cues of social health. Uh, so, you might have heard the stress response called the fight or flight response. The idea is that, uh, evolutionarily speaking, the, the purpose of this, this, uh, this physiological reaction is to put the body in a state where it can respond to an external challenge. Um, either with aggression, so the fight part of the response, or withdrawal, which is the flight part of the response, right? Um, and so when you think about potential psychological mediators of, of the relationship between this physiological stress state and these output behaviors of either fighting or fleeing, um, you might think that the stress would increase your sensitivity to social threats out there in the environment because you, know, you need to prepare your body to, to respond to those kinds of things. Right? Um, so that, that's kind of what we wanted to test. Um, we, we tested a, sub, uh, a group of 40 healthy boys who we can randomly assign to one of two conditions. The first being a stress condition, the second being a control condition in which they didn't receive stress. And then we asked them to categorize uh, emotional expressions. So we're using these emotional expressions as, um, as um, uh, cues, environmental cues of potential social threat or uh, different kinds of emotional cues. Um, this is one example of our stimulus. So this is a face that has been morphed, so it's half, exactly 50% uh, happy and 50% fearful. It's, we use the prototype emotions from the Minston um, stimulus set, and we just use a morphing program to really morph that way. Between. You can kind of test your own biases and decide whether you think it's more afraid or happy. Uh, basically, the, the task our boys had was simply to have these red and green buttons we're simply told, you know, just, just pick whichever one you think this face looks more like. So it's a forced choice to ask. Again, so, so you can kind of measure kids' biases when they're receiving this ambiguous um, emotional input from their environment. Do they have a bias to perceive the, the threat in it or, or the positive social signals in it? That's the kind of thing you can test with this, this paradigm. And so we had four different mix mixes. Um, I'm only going to show you the one that was significant. We did bone forming and correct our alpha levels because we were testing four different types of mixes. The other three didn't turn out to be significant. I'll go ahead and tell you the one that turned out to be significant is when you mix angry and fear together and ask kids, again, do you see this face as an angry face or a fearful face? 
And those in the no stress condition, they, they count as about half and half, um, those who are stressed were actually less likely to categorize the faces as angry and more likely to categorize them as fearful than uh, those who are stressed. So this, I have to admit, this result actually sort of surprised us, right? Like, if you think about the theory I just told you about, well, you know, stress leads to a fight or flight kind of response and, and should make you more, potentially more sensitive to social threat, well, then this, is, this, this result is not really intuitive. Um, the more we thought about it, the more we thought, okay, um, well, someone here, Shelley Taylor, has, has theorized a lot about um, the fact that f fight or flight is not the only possible uh, behavioral outcome to <coughs> stress. There's also a system for tend and befriend. She talks about it more in, the, in terms of a male, uh, predominantly male-female kind of distinction. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that it seems that, it, it, at least in this context, our, our healthy boys seem to have some other system of responding to the stress um, that may be indicative of something that's more like a tender breath friend kind of response. Um, again, preliminary, like this is sort of speculative based on, this is a leap from, from the actual evidence I have, but that's the, the best kind of uh, working hypothesis I have about what's going on, um, that the stress can reduce in this particular context um, with this particular population of, of individuals, sensitivity to social threat. And just in one more piece of evidence that is consistent with this. this. This is a study that was done by my colleagues, uh, also in Freiburg here, that was published very recently, suggesting that um, in a sample of healthy men, again, um, that when they were acutely stressed, again using the same stress as the trigger social stress test, um, it actually promoted uh, re-engagement with social partners in the sense that it, re uh, it promoted pro-social behavior. So these stressed, healthy men uh, were more likely than the non-stressed healthy men to show higher trust levels, trustworthiness, and sharing behavior. Um, so again, those I think those two results kind of fit together nicely, uh, suggesting that at least in certain contexts, the stress can have um, these these uh, differential effects that, that, that are not necessarily um, covered very well by the fight or flight response. Um, certainly, is the case that this is likely to interact with social context and. Okay, so so far, going back to my kind of recurring themes, we've seen some initial evidence that the oxytocin system is involved in uh, sensitivity to social support and social threat, and some evidence that social threat, such as uh, acute stress, can influence social cognition and social behavior. And in the case of that study I just showed you, it can influence uh, processing of ambiguous stimuli, social stimuli. third study, we were interested in looking at the relationship between the natural functioning of the oxytocin system and emotion recognition. Bringing this back to the, um, the clinical work that I was talking about before, I was saying uh, that some individuals might respond differently to the, spray, the oxytocin spray than others, right? This might have implications with, with how we use oxytocin nasal spray as part of the therapy uh, for individuals with psychopathology. So we wanted to directly test this by combining the genetic method with the intranasal administration method to explicitly test whether genetic variation influences individual differences in responses to intranasal oxytocin. We tested 200 healthy men, genotyped them, again, specifically first looking at the RS53576 SNP, the same one I talked about before. And these men we brought into the lab twice. So every individual came once and received oxytocin. The second time they came, or another time they came one week later and received either oxytocin or placebo. The order was randomized, it was double blind. Um, and after receiving one of these two substances, they complete the same social cognition tests. So this allows us to basically have a measure of every individual's own sensitivity to the oxytocin administration, because we can basically compare their performance under placebo and, and with, with that under oxytocin. So I'll show you um, that the, the, res the genotyping on these individuals just came back two weeks ago. So Again, preliminary results, uh, we're still doing a lot of analyses with this data set. But, but uh, one task that I have looked at um, at this point is, is our emotion recognition task. In this task, basically, an individual sees just one face in the middle of the screen, and it's morphing. It's a dynamic, dynamically morphing face uh, going from a neutral expression to one of uh, four target emotions, either happy, neutral, happy, sorry, happy, sad, angry, or fearful. That happens over the course of 800 milliseconds, and the task of the subject is simply press 
the space bar whenever you think you can recognize this emotion. Right? So it gives us basically a measure of the individual's ability to recognize pretty relatively subtle cues of emotion. Um, so uh, we analyzed the trials only that the, the subjects got right. Um, so where they're accurate at detecting these emotions and categorizing them correctly. And what we found is that uh, the individuals with the GG genotype were faster, were better at recognizing emotions under oxytocin than under placebo. Um, whereas those with either the AG or the AA genotype, so carries at least one copy of the allele, actually worse uh, under oxytocin. They're slower to recognize. Results suggesting that the effects of oxytocin uh, intranasal administration are not uh, consistent or are, are globally the same for, for um, individuals of different gene types. So we have some evidence that the effect of intranasal oxytocin administration interacts with the oxytocin receptor genotype. And um, I think this suggests that in the long term, uh, systematic research on individual differences in substance uh, sensitivity might help refine um, our, our attempts to use oxytocin in therapies for social disorders. Okay. Um, okay, again, back to the recurring themes. Uh, evidence that oxytocin, the oxytocin system influences sensitivity to social threat and social support, and that social <coughs> threat fundamentally shapes uh, social cognition and social behavior. Now I'd like to turn to two final studies. Uh, where I'm focusing on this, again, this idea that oxytocin regulates threat and threat regulates social cognition. Um, the, the results that I'm going to be showing are, are sort of more, um, support this hypothesis a little bit less directly, but I'd like to make a case for why I think this is what's going on and see if you guys are convinced by it. So the, in the first um, study, or yeah, well, second to last study, um, we were interested in the relationship between eye contact and attitudes. Again, you might be thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Well, it's, it's sort of indirect, but again, I'd like to make a case of why it's interesting and related. Um, we were interested in how eye contact influences receptiveness to opposing views. Eye contact is a biologically very primitive social signal. And even newborn infants are able to detect uh, direct versus averted gaze in their, uh, with, in the, with their social partners. And they prefer to look at direct gaze. Um, so it's perhaps perhaps not so surprising given the biological primitiveness of this particular social signal that it's under some sort of neuroendocrinological control. Um, so there's evidence now from three separate studies. I'm showing you a headline from the very first one that showed this. That oxytocin is involved in the regulation of eye gaze patterns, and specifically that it increases eye gaze, uh, group gaze towards the eye region. Uh, this, again, has been primarily interpreted as a very pro-social effect of oxytocin, right? And, and this is understandable because in most contexts, eye contact is very essential for promoting certain kinds of social behaviors and helping with social cognition. For example, it's essential in joint attention. It's essential in understanding others' uh, intentions. It's important for our ability to recognize the emotions being shown by other people. It regulates conversational turn-taking. Uh, it influences our social judgments of other people. And um, in, in, in a study that a colleague of, of mine and I did, uh, we found that, oxygen, sorry, we found that uh, it's involved in, um, well, it's, it's correlated with individuals' own self, their beliefs and their self-reported social functioning. So we found that the uh, tendency to reciprocate direct gaze is inversely correlated with an individual's self-reported autism spectrum. Characteristics. So basically, if you think of autism spectrum characteristics as a, as a measure of, um, of some sort of social deficits, uh, that's inversely related again with the tendency to, to, to make, uh, to reciprocate others' direct case. Okay, so I've made this case of why eye contact is a very pro-social phenomenon. Uh, that, uh, and it certainly is the case that lovers and friends use eye contact to signal attraction and desire to affiliate, and desire for social contact. contact. Um, however, um, <laughs> eye contact can be used in a very different way as well. 
I love these two pictures side by side because the physical configuration is so similar, right, as, as you can see. But presumably, the social signal that's being sent by these, between these two guys is very, very different than, than what's being sent here. And it's probably being interpreted in a very different way. So in our study, we, we um, had participants view videos of speakers. We filmed a bunch of student actors expressing opinions about controversial social issues and political issues. And we were interested in the role of eye contact in uh, our subjects' openness to these, to, to hearing these uh, counter-attitudinal views. And on the one hand, you know, with this kind of affiliative role of eye contact, you might think, okay, if participants make more eye contact in this context, it's a sign of like a desire to bond or affiliate, and uh, this might make them more open to what they're hearing. Or you might think, uh, well, you know, if they're hearing something that's sort of already kind of aversive, it's an opinion that they don't agree with, maybe the increased eye contact would, would actually sort of backfire in the sense that it makes individuals feel more threatened, right? Or makes individuals perceive this differently as like a dominance kind of contest or something like that. Um, so that's what we wanted to test. And we looked at 42 healthy adults who we randomly assigned to either eyes condition or mouth condition. So in the eyes condition, they're told simply, you're going to be watching these videos and just focus on the eyes of the speaker in the videos. Um, in the mouth condition, they're told, uh, focus on the, the mouth of the speakers in the videos. And then they watched four of these videos. Again, they were, they, we, we had their opinions on each of these issues beforehand through a survey. So we matched them with only videos that they were counterattitudinal for them, in which counterattitudinal messages were being expressed. Um, so they saw four videos, each about two minutes long. And again, we're told each, each time, focus on either the eyes and the mouth. And then we had some measures of their reactions to the videos. So we had measures of uh, receptiveness and of attitude change. Receptiveness is a construct, I'm going to go over this very quickly because it's, it's relevant for how, you, uh, how we think about the results, I think. Um, receptiveness is a construct, that, that, a psychological construct that uh, I've studied with some other collaborators in, in a couple other studies. And, and we see it as a measure of openness to current and future exposure to a point of view. So we get at it by asking our participants basically how open-minded and receptive did you feel about the message that was being presented. Uh, secondly, how willing would you be to have another conversation with the speaker in, in these videos or in this particular video? And thirdly, uh, how willing would you be to receive more information from this particular point of view? And the reason we think this is interesting is that uh, we see it as a possible intermediary to attitude change, right? So if you, if you hear an opinion about the death penalty or abortion or something where you have a really entrenched view, it's honestly not very likely that a two-minute video is really going to change your view dramatically, right? And that you're going to express very much uh, significant attitude change as a result. However, it, as long as you're sort of expressing an openness to it and a willingness to be exposed to more information that's relevant in the future, uh, maybe that's a signal that in, in the long term, uh, you might be moving towards uh, attitude change or conflict resolution and some, um, some, some long-term effects that we're interested in. Secondly, we know that this is, uh, through our other studies, that this variable is sensitive to situational context. context. So unlike a variable like um, openness to experience, which is one of the big five personality traits and thought to be relatively stable across the lifespan, receptiveness does seem to be um, something that we can manipulate with relatively subtle changes in the situation that individuals find themselves in. So again, this was our primary psychological dependent measure. And uh, here, um, just, uh, okay, I'm going to be showing you the uh, effects of the being in one of the, assigned to one of these two conditions on both receptiveness and attitude change. And this is a Likert scale that ranges from negative three to positive three. So negative three means absolutely not, no receptiveness, and in fact, attitude change in, in the opposite direction. That's what the speaker was saying. The positive score for receptiveness or uh, attitude change in the direction of what the speaker was saying. So if you look just at the people in the eyes condition, you see not so much going on. Not so much receptiveness, not so much attitude change. Those in the mouth condition actually show significantly more receptiveness and significantly more uh, attitude change. Uh, so uh, this is just showing you the mediation analysis. The, the effect of psychological receptiveness does seem to mediate the relationship between the condition assignment and uh, the eventual attitude change. So it seems that eye contact in this context is reducing receptiveness to counter-attitudinal information. 
And again, I don't have direct evidence for this yet. We're doing this work in follow-up studies uh, to look at whether heightened threat is a mechanism. That's, that's my working hypothesis, that, it's, that, that this context of hearing these counter-attitudinal messages uh, from these speakers is more like the UFC wrestler's condition or, or more like two dogs that are staring each other down in a dominance context than the affiliative context between two lovers or two friends. Um, so in, in follow-up studies where we're specifically testing for sort of threat responses and the function of, of eye contact versus looking at, at other areas of the face in these studies, and also looking for maybe dynamic feedback between um, neuroendocrine input. So again, I, I told you before that oxytocin increases looking at the eyes, right? But also oxytocin is thought to increase affiliative motivations. So what would happen if we administered our participants in this context oxytocin? Well, should if it's consistent with prior research, increase looking at the eyes, but maybe that neuroendocrine system that's activated through oxytocin will lead to a different interpretation of, of uh, or different uh, tendency to interpret that eye contact as affiliative rather than as competitive. And so you might see a flip in the results. So those are all open questions um, that, that I think will be really interesting to look at in the near future. Yeah, just, just curious, if yeah. what, um, is there any reason that you concluded from this that eye contact can reduce receptiveness rather than maybe there's something about looking at the mouth that increases receptiveness. Well, how do you how do you determine what the baseline is? That's a good that's a good point. Um, yeah, in a in a follow-up study, uh, I would I mean this is the, you're right. This is my intuition that it okay. has more to do with eye contact than looking at the mouth because I don't think that uh, looking at the mouth is, is is I personally don't think looking at the mouth is driving the effects. Um, but yeah, you could imagine another control of the person is told look at the ear or something, right? And just to make sure that it's not that look at the mouth is doing something special. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Okay, final study was a study on the role of oxytocin on friendship formation. This is an intranasal administration study. We don't have quite the numbers of subjects to be able to do the genetic analyses and so require much larger sample sizes. So we're simply looking at the effects of oxytocin versus placebo administration. On, on subjects as uh, um, psychology or, or uh, our uh, tendencies after after substance administration. We tested 100 healthy men, and we administered again randomized double blind, uh, either oxytocin or placebo to the individuals. And then we further split up the individuals and had half of those receiving each substance receive, oh, sorry, view a normal looking peer. I'll show you the pictures in a minute. Normal looking peer, a strong peer. Uh, these are all 100. These were 100 uh, heterosexual um, healthy men. We wanted to ensure that, that this is a they perceive this as a friendship um, seeking context. And then after, so so basically, we have four different groups, 25 subjects in each group. And all of the individuals, uh, after viewing one of these potential targets of a, a friendship or of an interaction, then rated their likelihood of becoming friends with this person and uh, some other social judgment measures, for example, how likely would you find this, this person? Um, so, so these are our two guys. You, you'll first of all notice, well, you'll notice the difference in body morphology. This is you know, obviously a strong guy, strong guy. Um, It's the same head photoshopped up on two bodies. We did that because it's a between subject design, so every subject only saw one of these two guys. And we wanted to make sure there's no differences in, in the facial features or uh, emotional expressions that was driving any effects. And this is, again, a Likert scale ranging from 1 to 9, uh, where the participants simply rated how likely they were to become friends with this person. Under placebo, individuals rate the normal guy as a much more likely target of uh, friendship than the strong guy. Under oxytocin, uh, there's, a, well, there's a significant interaction between substance administration and body morphology of the target in predicting likelihood of friendship readings. And if you do the post hoc comparisons, this, this one is not significant. So individuals under placebo and oxytocin don't differ in their ratings of, of this guy. Um, however, oxytocin significantly attenuated this tendency in the placebo condition. In the placebo condition, somehow those participants are seeing this guy as not, not as, as, as worthy of friendship somehow, right? And oxyto oxytocin attenuates that tendency. A quick question. Um, did you control the size of the subjects themselves? Yes, great question. Uh, we, we checked for that. We asked the subjects, how strong do you think you are yourself? Um, and we looked at, uh, if we include that as a covariate for any of our analyses, it doesn't make a difference. 
and it doesn't, and what else um, is important? Um, oxytocin doesn't change individuals' perceptions of their own strength or perceptions of this guy's strength. So it's not that oxytocin is simply making you see this guy as less strong. You see him as equally strong, but you rate him as um, a better candidate for friendship. Then we looked for some hint of a psychological mediator of this rating of uh, likelihood of friendship, and we simply asked the targets how, how likable they found these targets. And again, you see uh, basically exactly the same pattern. The, the, um, the strong guy is rated as less likable, but under oxytocin, uh, this, this, uh, he's, he's rated as somewhat more, significantly more likable, uh, no difference in the placebo um, oxytocin for the strong guy. Uh, again, the interaction between substance administration and body morphology of the target is significant here. And again, if you put this in a mediation analysis, this likability uh, rating does mediate the relationship between um, substance administration and body morphology on um, likelihood. Their participants' ratings of likelihood of becoming friends. So again, unfortunately, I don't have direct evidence that threat is a mediator here, but that's the story I'm trying to sell because I think it's the most likely uh, story of why this strong guy is perceived by heterosexual men as less likable and uh, less less good as a candidate uh, for um, for friendship, that, that somehow he's perceived as threatening, and that the oxytocin is reducing the, the feeling of threat you have in, when you uh, view this individual, and so that uh, oxytocin is allowing us to um, uh, express more willingness to affiliate with this particular kind of stranger. So not all strangers, but potentially threatening strangers. Um, so I view this as very interesting because it suggests a possible biological mechanism for the formation and expansion of extended human social networks. Um, since I'm talking to a group who is interested in behavior and evolution and, and culture, um, there's this slide in here for you guys. Um, this is what I mean is that um, in basically all mammalian species that have been studied, uh, the oxytocin system has been found to be really essential for mother infant attachment. And so it's thought that oxytocin evolved to support this function. This, this sort of makes sense given the importance of these bonds for the survival of, uh, for the survival of infants in mammalian species. Okay, and then in a subset of mammalian species, I'm not the first to make this particular argument. Larry Young, for example, one of the, the big researchers on the walls, has made this argument. Um, so about 5% of mammalian species are monogamous and form uh, stable pair bonds, the variables being a famous example of that, those. And uh, so he argued that uh, perhaps the oxytocin system, which originally evolved for this purpose, at some point in evolution got co-opted in some species for the support of uh, pair bonding and, and monogamous um, relationships between adults of those species. What I'm arguing is that perhaps uh, the oxytocin system has been co-opted even further by some species to support the formation of friendship bonds that extend beyond familial relationships and extend beyond romantic relationships. Again, it's a speculative claim, but uh, something that, that perhaps might be interesting, interesting for us to discuss. In any case, I, I hope I've shown you through this, this rapid tour through a, a number of different studies using a number of different methodologies that first of all, the human oxytocin system plays a key role in sensitivity to social support and social threat. We see this in terms of individual differences uh, marked by variation in the oxytocin receptor gene, as well as situational effects um, like that you see when you either administer oxytocin or placebo. And that social threat and the regulation of it fundamentally shape social cognition and social behavior. We saw this in the boy's sensitivity to social cues in the form of emotional expressions after they were faced with the social threat um, of the stress situation. We saw this in terms of participants uh, receptiveness to opposing opinions after receiving the potentially threatening stimulus of, of eye contact. And we saw this in terms of social approach and willingness to form new friendships with individuals who are potentially more or less threatening to you depending on their, their physical characteristics. Um, so those are the general conclusions. And then, and then more broadly speaking, I think that um, this is just one domain in which um, looking at the intersection between biological and psychological factors on human social functioning is going to turn out to be first very theoretically interesting as well as have direct applications for uh, things like the treatment of uh, social disorders and our understanding of health outcomes for, for members of our species. Uh, with that, 
I would like to thank, first of all, my wonderful host institute, or host lab in Freiburg, uh, my, my primary advisor there, Marcus Heinrichs, and, and many wonderful colleagues and mentors and students there, as well as colleagues and mentors throughout the world who have uh, contributed in, in many ways and to my research and ideas, and, and with, without whom this research would not have been possible, as well as several funding organizations that have supported me in my research in the past couple of years. And to all of you for listening. Thank you.